is it's okay to fail and um when we fail how can we make this journey while we're failing more enjoyable how can we use that failure as a stepping stone to build for greater and better things it's inevitable yeah the best players in the world say messi ronaldo the best players in the world they, they fail constantly you can see it in their facial expressions when they miss a chance you know when they've got to a ball slightly late when they've misplaced a pass Kedman. <laughs> Welcome back. Good. Love to, to be to here. England. <laughs> <laughs> First time on the show. How are you feeling? I'm feeling good. I'm looking forward to hearing what you have to say. I think I think they're looking forward to hearing what you have to say. Even better. So basically, you are the host. I am the guest. Because we're here to pick your brains on the ins and out of football, how it works. Mm-hmm. Why it works, why it fails, and we're going to talk about your project, which is the book. I read your book, um, the first, I haven't read the whole book. I read mm-hmm. the first page, the opening paragraph. Mm-hmm. It is amazing. <laughs> like, literally, like, whoa, because when people are striving for success or do what they want to do, mm-hmm when you plan the process of being successful in your head, everything is smooth. Mm. You know, you, you get a job or you get a business, you get this worker, you get this contract, you know, you get this, this networking and then you're making millions of pounds. But as soon as your first hurdle hits you, you're like, whoa. And then it takes very strong-willed individuals to go through and take it to the next stage. But little do they know that the next stage also has more hurdles. Mm. And then just keep going and going. And your book, the opening paragraph, like just like, it's okay. You're going to fail. Mm. But that is the secret ingredient, success. How did you derive to even come up with the book? Uh, so I say life experience. Life experience played a big part. Um, mentors, uh, just seeing from other people's experiences and stuff and the times that we're in, I think, because during this time, a lot of people are stressed. A lot of people are going through problems with loss of work. Um, some people have lost their relatives. And I think in the career industry, in the job industry, everyone faces their failures. So I think it was the best time to to put everyone in the perception that failure is a part of this this journey that we all in. And um, we want to strive for success. So in order for that to happen, we're going to fail. How many times did you fail so far to date? Because you are a quite successful person, which a lot of people don't even realize how hard it is to be successful. How many times did you fail? Uh, I couldn't tell you. I couldn't tell you. Because I almost seek failure. I almost seek it. I, um, I'm big on that should have been better. I needed to do that differently. I need to adapt. I need to change. I'm big on that. Because I want to grow. How did you derive that? Because that's a lot of pressure on you. So when you do something successful, do you celebrate it? Or do you then say, I should have done better? You know what it is? I think, I think I'm, I'm my bit- biggest critic. So it started from, I think, from, from young, right? And my mom, she's very, very um, motivational. And yeah. Uh, yeah, and I have a family who's very competitive. So, and I was the young one. So um, I looked up to everyone and I wanted to be better. I wanted to compete in every, everything we did from basketball to football to whatever. I detect a little bit of an accent in you, sir. So is it true to say you wasn't always in the UK? No, I've I've, I've travelled, I've travelled. I spent years in the States, in New York, in Brooklyn. Mm. Um, and you might hear that, my accent. I can hear it. And I was born in London. I actually moved to New York when I was a little baby. And uh, I came back 
I was like 11, 12. Yeah. And yeah, so you could probably hear the... I can hear it. I can yeah. hear it. Going back to the book, mm-hmm. what do you want your readers and your fans to take from that book? Because the title alone is striking. Oh, your success? Yeah. And people don't mix the two. Mm. They think success is on this side failure that oh, you failed or you're successful you failed or you when when the readers get your when when your fans read your book what do you want them to get from it oh that's a good question um the the first thing is i want everyone to have an open mind because like failure <laughs> like there's so many things you can look at when you read a book and say this is done different this should have been done differently this should be done this way and and i'm it's my first book so I really want people to take the content in the book and the message behind it. And the main message behind it is it's okay to fail. And um, when we fail, how can we make this journey while we're failing more enjoyable? How can we use that failure as a stepping stone to build for greater and better things? I'm I'm a true believer in what you said because I believe the best way to learn is to fail get something wrong because as soon as you get something wrong your mind your body muscle memory everything will register that i got that wrong Mm. then next time when you think of doing or making the same mistake you literally gonna remind yourself no that was wrong and then from then you make a different decision you might also still get it wrong but it will be less wrong than before and if you try it more and more the more wrongs you get the quicker you derive to correctness so i'm a big believe on that for you you felt every day at work hmm. it's inevitable yeah the best players in the world we say messi ronaldo the best players in the world they, they fail constantly you can see it in their facial expressions when they miss a chance you know when they've got to a ball slightly late when they've misplaced a pass they fail how hard is it to be a footballer <sighs> to Man. make it because in the UK alone, right, mm-hmm. 1.5 million young players go to want to become professional footballers. Mm. Only about 180 of them yeah. make it. 1.5 million players, young kids, and only 180 roughly give or take a few hundreds here or there or a few tens or twenties or fifty maybe one who knows only make it for you that has made it as a professional footballer you played the likes of chelsea you played in spain played in germany i believe i uh, played in belgium belgium sorry how hard is it to make it and once you get there is it what it seems to be it's so interesting because I think the idea of making it to everyone is is subjective. So you have the the highest level of our craft. So we look at Premier League football and when you're talking about football and you have the tail end, which is like, say, and the lowest end of professional football, right? And I think even the players that are at the highest level, like when you have conversations Making it isn't ever like a a fixed, like, oh, I've made it now. It's always something that you've reached a, a certain goal and you feel that relief, like, and you can celebrate it, yeah? And then you think, all right, what can I do next? Like, because the ultimate dream is to have a full career and to have accolades and achieve and win trophies if you can. And that's never ended until your career is done. So... What I would say is that a lot of people give up. A lot of people give up. A lot of young kids, they think, oh, I haven't got my scholar or I've not signed to an academy. And now, oh, I didn't get my pro. And it's it's strange because everyone has an inner voice, right? We all have like an inner voice. The inner voice is a big part of who we are, right? And if your inner voice is telling you, all right, I'm not good enough, right? I don't want to do this anymore. A lot of the time, you're going to stop, right? If your inner voice doesn't even have that voice, it <laughs> doesn't have that thought process, doesn't have that, 
that whole negativity doesn't exist, yeah. then you stand a chance. So I think you're ahead of the rest if you can kill that negativity in your inner voice. How do you kill that off? Because as a young as a young player, we're just gonna focus on um young players. How do you kill that off? Because as a young player, imagine you you thought you had a good game, and the next game the coach puts you on the bench. How do you then overcome that inner voice? Because that inner voice is powerful. Because mm. it no one can hear it, so no one can say, "Oh, don't." It, it's constantly there. You go to sleep, it's there. You wake up, it's there. You're eating, it's there. Mm. You know, you think you're having fun with your friends. It's just constantly there. Yeah. And the more you hear it, you will start believing that. Mm. You know, it's it just fact. The more someone tells you, you rubbish, you rubbish, you rubbish, you rubbish, you rubbish, it's only a matter of time before your brain just says, okay, yes, you are rubbish, you are rubbish, you are rubbish. And it's like the placebo effect. You start believing you're rubbish. Mm. And everything that you put out there is rubbish. So how can a kid silence that? I think... All right, so the way I could only talk about the experience I've had, really, um, the way I silenced it, right, is I found, um, I watched a video. It was uh, about, it's from Eric Thomas, who's a motivational speaker. I was, whenever this video came out, this was when I really killed the negativity. E.T. E.T. And he shout talked. Shout out to E.T. Shout out to E.T. He talked about what's your why? What's the reason why you do what you do, right? And for me, I just love to play football. I love sport in general. I love playing basketball. I love playing football. For me, I just enjoyed sport. Um, it was my escape from reality sometimes. It was my freedom to just express myself. And um, when I say escape, escape reality, I just mean I'm a thinker. Yeah. And, you know, and just having that chance to be creative and that platform to be creative and receive love, give love. I think so, Um, yeah. Back to your question, killing that inner voice, I think it starts from knowing what your why is. And then when you know what your why is, you understand that if that passion for your why is strong, then you have to recognize the things that are going to stop you from achieving your why. So I understood that everyone's going to criticize me. I noticed that really young. Everyone's going to criticize whether they think whether it's extreme to, oh, you're shit, <laughs> right? Mm. Or whether it's, he's not ready, he, you know? They're going to criticize. If I criticize myself now, I need to be doing it in a constructive way. And I, then I started to understand the visualization, the self-talks. And, yeah, I, I just just killed it. I just killed it. Um, but it's a constant battle. You you face that battle every day. And, um yeah, that's that's how I, how I get rid of it. So if I was to give advice to someone really young, um, I'd say listen to the people that are positive. Listen to the people that are positive. And you said something earlier on, which is very powerful. You your role models, which I think a lot of people growing up nowadays don't have good role models around them, mm -hmm. and that's crucial. How did you go on about finding your role models? Oh, I didn't need to look far. I didn't need to look far. My mom, she's incredible. She played international football. She uh, she had an interior design company, so she was really creative. And she was a bas basketball coach as well. So I, I seen it firsthand. Um, and then my aunties, uncles, my dad. Uh, I, I reconnected with my dad later on in my life, but like they all had a lot of inspiration then coaches, players, um, guys around the neighborhood that weren't even probably doing so quote unquote good things, but they had good things to say to me. Um but yeah. So here's a question, you have to be truthful. Who's better? You or your mom at football? At football. <laughs> She's the goat man. <laughs> <laughs> Greatest of all time. <laughs> you know what? I Mom's love football. Um for me, um I meditate and mm. A lot of people don't understand that you can meditate through sport. Mm. And whenever I'm on the pitch, I'm a, I'm a striker, I play midfield. I'm like an attacking midfielder, but scoring goals is too easy. As a left back, <laughs> I would have just, you would have, you would have been too easy for me. <laughs> uh, trust me. But when I'm on that pitch, mm. I'm like the king, the 
president, I'm, it's like my world. Mm. Nothing matters. I'm so engrossed in the game. It's such a beautiful feeling. What is it like playing in front of thousands oh. of people? What is that? F- what does that feel like? Man, you know, I think before the game, you're conscious of it. Like the first time, you're conscious of it. Um, but as soon as you step out, and for me, a big thing is as soon as I cross the line, I focus on what the task at hand. Like I, I feel like it's another me. That's it's another Michael, yeah. right? And um, that feeling's it's incredible. I, I think the chance, the chance is the best. When first time I, I heard them chant my name, that was like a, a real like, good feeling. You How know? does it go? Michael Kedman. Do. Michael Kedman. <laughs> that could be the intro for this for this interview, isn't it, JB? <laughs> nah. Okay. <laughs> you just said nah. Nah. <laughs> <laughs> nah. I mean, sometimes as as a youngster, even up now, I still visualize that I'm I'm an Arsenal fan. I still visualize that I'm playing in the Emirates and they're chanting my name. And just visualizing it. It's a beautiful feeling and I could literally run without thought sometimes for about 10, 15 minutes. Mm. And for a man like you who's been there, done it, and now you're sharing your story, we appreciate that. We appreciate that. What I really want to um, dive into is how many hours do you need to put in to be a professional football? Oh, man, that's a good question. All right, have you ever read um, Outliers by Malcolm Gladwell? Yes, 10,000 hours, he said. That's not even enough. I don't think it's enough. I don't know if I've... I think I've just over 8,000 hours, something like that. And I, we tried to calculate it, me and my friends. Oh, wow. Yeah, just over 8,000. But I don't think it's enough. Um, you, In order to master some master your craft, you're saying it takes 10,000 hours, right? So they say. So they say. For me, we're human, you know? So, like... We almost need to caress our craft. You know, we need to constantly pay attention to it. And time is not really a a way to measure um, what performance you'll have in football the next day. Because you might be feeling a certain way. Your mind might be elsewhere. Um, Your body might be tired. You know, you might feel pressure from the game or the experience that you're about to face. So um, for me, it's a matter of, Staying consistent. So every day, do something towards what you want to achieve. Not even in football. I think every day, the consistency, when you build up that consistency, your mind starts to adapt, your body starts to adapt, your surroundings start to adapt to, to what you want to achieve, I think. So it's ma- more of a, uh, it's not really a time thing. It's more of a, can I be consistent? Which is, it's, it's funny you, got, you refer to um, outliers. Because in the book, he says that mm. in some cases, your age plays a big factor, depending yeah. on when you're born, and also your access to the craft that is you want to be. He used um, Bill Gates, for example. Bill Gates had access to computers way before anyone else. Mm-hmm. And I, I believe the opening of the book, he looked at hockey players in, yeah. in, in Canada, the age group. Is that the same for footballers? It works different for club football and na- international football, for example. I'm a 96 born, right? So I'd be the youngest in the national team age group. And it works that way abroad. So let's say in Germany, Belgium, these places. But in England, we go off the school year. I was in the middle. In a way. So yeah. here's a question. Trinidad and Tobago calls you up. Yeah. So Michael, we want to play in the World Cup. You're super excited. Yeah. You want to go. You <laughs> want to be there. Tell your mom, tell everyone. Starting next month, and then a week later, Gareth Southgate calls you up, <laughs> yeah, saying, "We need you." Yeah, who would you choose, and why? That's a great question. I don't think it's a pos- I don't think it's possible. <laughs> why not? <laughs> Only reason because I you think haven't played for Trinidad and Tobago, have you? No, I haven't. And you haven't played for England. True. So it's possible. It is possible. Okay. So who the would reason, you choose? The reason I said it isn't possible is because. The 
Oh, all right. Let's say it's possible. It is possible. Yeah, let's it say is it's possible, possible, right? See, he tried to think about a reason why it's not possible, yeah, yeah. and he couldn't derive to one. So we then say it's possible. So let's go. See, I didn't kill my negative voice there. See? Still he, battling. See, I killed it for him. Sometimes we need that. I got you. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's a good question. To be honest, I'm stuck right now still because I got the call from Jamaica. I got the call from Trinidad. Oh, wow. So it's a blessing. I needed to sort of passport stuff and all these things, but that's a decision I have to make. So maybe I'm I'm pretty indecisive. I, I was raised in a Trini Bajan home, reconnected with my dad, who's on the Jamaican side. And now I, I am curious and intrigued by Jamaica as well. But... It's a what, what, the reggae boys. It's the reggae boys, isn't the it? When's the last time they actually qualified for anything? Football wise, nineteen ninety-eight. Still, <laughs> Imagine if they had Hussein Bolt, uh, Safa Powell, all the runners. They'll be all right. <laughs> Literally, just give me the ball, boom. boom. No, so who would you choose then? How? Uh, oh, oh, you know what? Let's not put that on record because I don't want anyone coming after us. I said you chose that on this show. That's you know, a tough one. You know what? The way I was going to go about the decision is um, I wanted to see one of the camps first and see how, how the vibe is and see how it connected because I know players on the Trinidad national team already. Like, um, and I thought if I, if, I, if I go to the camp, then I can like, get, a, get a feeling of what the energy is like. And if I enjoy it, then, then I'll pick Trinidad. Now I'm already in England. Now if Gareth South, Southgate was to call me up, I would uh, go to the camp, see what it's like. What if, let's put a, a, a twist in it, all the camps take exactly the same energy? Because you know, you know both players from both camps. Yeah, good point. Exactly same. Michael, what's that? Like, same love, same energy, apart from yeah. in uh, Tobago and Trinidad, the, the, the weather will be nice, the jerk chicken will be all over the place. Here you got um, fish and chips. Yeah, you know what? Uh, all right, so I'll give an example. Raheem Sterling, he's, he was born in Jamaica, right? Yeah. And he plays for England. And I think that was a smart decision because he brought that whole fan base that England has and that whole uh, to him, right, which was good. Then he can use his platform now to show great things about Jamaica. So that's the route you would take. So you would choose England. Yeah, we'll follow Raheem. In order for to help the better of football back there so people could follow Michael. Yeah, you... I he think should have been a politician, you know. See how he politically answered that question. <laughs> <laughs> We're trying. <laughs> but yeah, I think that would be a smarter move because I think I've seen somewhere uh, exposure leads to expansion. Yes. And with the England set up, you'll be more exposed, so... Yeah, no, that 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 I've never thought of it like that. That is that makes a lot of sense. Talking about football, I, who's your favorite player of all time? Oh, um, like personally, like the player that I I like, my favorite player of all time is a difficult one because I like so many players. You have to choose one. If I had to choose one, I like Marcelo. Why? Only because I'm left-footed. I wanted to be like Marcelo okay. um, for a long period of time. I love Ronaldinho. I love Messi as a player. I think they're incredible players. Um, I respect Ronaldo. There's a, there's a long list. Um, okay, we, we non-professional players have this d- debate all the time, right? Let's hear it from a professional. Ronaldo or Messi? You know, I think they've both reached a, a time where... The man yeah. is a... You know what? He can run for London Mayor, you know. The man is a professional politician. <laughs> Ronaldo or Messi? We just want one. Just give us a name. I prefer Messi. Messi. Okay, me too. Messi or Ronaldinho? Ronaldinho. Ronaldinho or JJ Ococha? <laughs> I'll be honest. I haven't seen enough of what JJ Ococha. You haven't seen enough of JJ Ococha? Hold on. JB's looking in the background like that's a silly question. Yeah, that that's true. JJ never had you know you know Ronaldinho. JJ actually helped Ronaldinho at PSG. 
Rav, look it up. JJ, if you don't, don't know who... Actually, you know, the young generation don't know who JJ Okocha is. I oh, know, I know who he is. But not... not look up JJ Okocha. He expressed himself so well. He used to flick it over players' heads. Like, the things he could do, the ball was, like, incredible. It was madness. Yeah. Madness. How many goals you scored in a game? The most goals you've ever scored in a game? Oh, man. We was, um, I think, under 13s, right? And we had, like, an in-house game. And I scored. <laughs> Look at the smile on I'll his face. I'll never forget this, right? <laughs> All right? It's not the most goals I've scored, but I'll tell you the best feeling from the goals. I scored four, right, from left back. Listen, four I'll never forget left? that. I'll never forget it. You know what? There's something about scoring a goal. Once, um, oh man, once I'm on a pitch, the best goals I've ever scored, I never, th- you don't think about it. The mm. ball just comes, because I'm a slow mover. Like on a pitch, I'm slow. And a lot of defenders think, yeah, he's slow. I can get the ball. I'm so skillful with it. And mm-hmm. I can hold the ball. I can hold the ball. It's I pretty. see you play. Man. I L- gotta see this. You man. have to. Like a lot of people, like <laughs> especially what I do is when I go on the pitch, especially when I'm playing with people, um, I don't know. Mm. I just like, I just just normal. Like I try to do whatever I can to make them believe I'm useless mm. for the game. And when I get the ball, by the time they realize they're shot, that they're in shock, they're in disbelief, and I got them. Okay. And I got them. And try, no, we, we should set something up. I'm not sure if you're allowed. We didn't speak to your, your manager. What is that like in terms of um, management and scouting? Oh, so manager, when as in, in a club or yeah. your agent? Your, sorry, agent. Yeah. yeah. Oh, man. I have a good relationship with my agent. Like, we're, we're pretty close. Um, I think it's before... Um, an agent's very important. I, I didn't realize this when I was young. And it's it's so important because when um you're just uh, turning sixteen and you're going into full time football, um out of school, I think your your mindset is everything's gonna go like you were saying exactly how you want it to go, and um I think you need to have that support, someone that's experienced the game, and um my dad's experienced the game to a certain extent. And my mom's experienced the game to a certain extent. But at the same time, the background and, and behind the scenes sort of um, supports important. The knowledge and the, the experience to go in an office and represent who you, like represent you. That's, that's exactly, I think, an age is born. But in terms of playing with you, um, I'm, I'm, I'm with it, man. We so can you're, do it. so you're allowed to do that? Yeah, I, of course. I'm, I'm, I'm mindful that I have to be careful, but, but yeah. Yeah, don't don't worry. I, I I'll make sure I don't injure you. <laughs> I'll make sure. Yeah. I'll take it easy. I'll, I'll take it easy. I seen your um your you showed me your toilet paper challenge. Yeah, that was. Yeah. <laughs> there's there's levels to this, guys. Please check out. There's there's levels to this. There's levels to this. If you was to write, uh, let's make it try. If you was to write an eight step guide to make it as a professional, yeah. What would step one be? Talk us through step one, two, three, four, all the way to eight. And let's say step eight, you make it. You play for whatever team you desire. What are the challenges? What do you have to go through as a young player? Because the young players or parents who want their kids to be footballers, they're probably listening to this or watching this. I want my son to make it or my daughter to make it. What can we do? What's the first thing they should do? All right, so the the first thing is... um, I think you have to play football. Like, find if you're playing with your friends or play, like, you need to play football, even if it's a local club. And um, when you play football, I think you need to develop, like, that belief. That second one, I think, is the belief. So let's say the first one, you play football. Second one's the belief. Um, and then when you're playing as much football as you can, I think you want to perform. The The scouts are watching. Like, they're, they're in places you wouldn't believe. So, really? um. They yeah. still do scouts. They scout. They scout school football. They scout. They scout everywhere. The scouts are everywhere. Um, so if you're performing and you're developing your game and you play outside of the times you have games, you train by yourself, develop your game, develop your game, and play as much as you can. That's that's the first. Let's say two or three steps, right? That's three. So you said uh, play, play football, believe, believe, and perform. Perform. The next one, I'd say is studying the game 
so your football knowledge and if i was a parent i'd just let my child watch football because um what you really want is good references from your coaches good references from your peers the players that play around you that you understand the game because that's a big part so the fourth would be studying the game yep the fifth i'd think would be contact as many people so if you're the parent contact as many people you know in the game or that might be around the game or might give your son or daughter the best opportunity to play um and then we'll be on sixth sixth yep yeah i'd say the next thing is when you get your opportunity take it with both hands right learn from it um if it goes well great you're there um the seventh i'd say be persistent don't stop you're, you're gonna get an opportunity there's 92 professional clubs in england let alone outside of england so if you push you you'll, you'll make yourself even even if you're all right i've realized people might think this as well you know when you're sitting on the couch at home i'm trying to think of it from a fan's perspective right because i'm a fan of the game too um and you watch players you think oh how did he make it as a professional yes right? yes a they, lot of people think i'm that. sorry i'm sorry there's a lot of Players in the Premiership, I would have, I would have been doing a better job than them. Is that I'm not even joking. So it just goes to show that you're there's no, like, what's the best way to explain? There's no, there's no limit. There's no quota. There's no, uh, like every team's different. The requirements to to make yourself um, perform at a certain level is just to do with the work you do in the background. And I think. It's possible, like you were saying, it's possible. So um, I think persistence is a big thing. And a lot of those players, their work ethic, that would be the, the ninth, say. Yeah, so that's what's going to make yeah. you work. Yeah, your work ethic and um, eating right, sleeping right. That's, that's combined. So your self-care, looking Cause, out. Because you yourself. don't drink. Nah, you I don't drink. I say, well, I have drunk. I have drunk. But I'm try- I don't drink... Uh, I only would drink on a, a birthday or it's my birthday special today, you know? occasion. Nah, no chance. <laughs> <laughs> Put some Lucas in. <laughs> nah, no, that you know what that is true. Let me so so there you go, ladies and gentlemen. Michael's next book is the eight steps to make as a professional player, co-written by Francis Co. Ten percent, please. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's all I need. Ten percent. Which is um what's interesting about what you said is uh, the fourth stage, you're saying study the game. There is nothing more frustrating when I'm playing football and I'm playing with players who just don't understand the game. Like it, like I'll give you a simple ball, like you there, I, I move to the left or right, that's a one two. Mm. Just give it back to me. I know, man. You know, or or I'm running with the ball, I'm running at defenders, you're on my left or right. You running? I'm just gonna give you a through ball, but you're just waiting for ah that really it really like, I take football very seriously. I can see. Like, I, as as an Arsenal fan, I had to slow down because yeah, my team are going through some serious. Our effect. team. Yeah, but yeah. So, uh, at least we're not United supporters. We live in London. Yeah. I like some people, but anyway, we leave the the the, the background stuff. Stay in the background. So, there's a kid out there who wants to make as a footballer. Mm. Um, put the eight steps aside. What advice would you give them? Oh, okay. Um, why do you want to be a footballer? Mm. Ask yourself that question. What type of footballer do you want to be? Do you want to be a player that plays at the highest level? you want to be the best player in the world? Write that down, too. Write down what you represent when you play. So, if you have flair if you want to be a strong defender, if you want to be a goalkeeper, write down what player you represent, put it all down on a paper, list it, list the things you don't like about your game, list the things you like about your game, and put it somewhere to be seen on the wall, and then add to it. That uh, That is true, and that's visualization, you're visualizing, um, you're almost bringing it out to the world, and the yeah. universe has a, has a, magical way of making something that you want if you strongly believe in it come true let's let's d- 
diving in a little bit more serious note now. Mm. As a professional footballer who played for a lot of professional football clubs and travelled around the world playing, is it hard for a black man playing football? <laughs> yeah, that, that goes without saying. Um, I've experienced racism. It's not nice. It's, it's horrible. Um, I think you get it more when you're playing good. So you don't make sense. I don't know. I think I think it's just ignorance most of the time. Um, so you got to develop that skill to block it out. I think you have to be mindful that you are representing something different. So I think the best way is to to understand both sides and forgive people, you know? Like don't harbor negativity as a black man and hold your head up high and perform. That's, that's it. Represent. Is there things put in place for by football clubs to try prepare? They shouldn't even need to try to prepare things, I think. Me, it's disgusting, and I'm not just saying that because I'm a black person myself. I think you shouldn't judge a person based on this, their skin color. Like it's just we bleed the same, we eat the same. Anything any other race can do, we can do. Um, so I don't see no difference. Like if you was to, if you was to cut me a little bit and I bleed and cut another person who's got a different skin color from me, cut them and put the blood in in see through containers and choose which ones we, you you wouldn't tell. Mm. Do, do clubs put measures in place to try protect black players or players of colour against racism? See, I played abroad, so I've experienced it mainly abroad. I have experienced it in England, but obviously I, I was at Chelsea for a while and I was at West Ham and up north at Sheffield United. And um, I don't think... I don't think it was a, as, I can't speak on every club. The experiences that I've had, I've had coaches that I didn't feel. Because I think racism is a thing that you feel sometimes. You can feel it, you know. Um, like in Iceland, I didn't feel one bit of racism. I, the whole period I was there, the time recently, I, I didn't feel one, one bit of racism. Uh, so for me... I think that they're putting things in place. So I know the PFA, um, the Premier League, the LFE, they're, they're making, they're raising awareness. And then you have um, the Kick It Out movement, which is quite like big with, um, I think it's Troy Townsend. Forgive me if I'm wrong. It's Townsend's dad. Okay. Yeah. And um, they, they have the talks during our scholarship at Sheffield United, um, Troy Townsend, he came in. And he sp he spoke to us, so I think they're all think they're putting things in place. And now, with the Black Lives Matter movement, um, where the players were taking a knee, I think it raised more awareness. And yeah, um, things are changing. When my dad was playing, um, like he told me, he used to get spat on, and like horrible things. So it's definitely improved. I haven't experienced that. I know there might be players that have, but I haven't experienced. Mm -hmm the direct contact, but, so yeah, um, it's evolving, we'll see. Because I've experienced it on, on Sunday League football, Jeez. you know, where there was just the only fans watching is, is um, just a few parents or friends, and, and I'm talking about, I've never played f a football game in, for more than 30 people, like watching, so I've experienced it on that level, and listen, my blood went off the roof. Like, wow, we won't even talk about that incident. A few times, actually, it happened. And the coach has to look, it happens. We have to be, there's a better way to deal with it. But it was the first time it ever happened to me. Of like, it, it was like, a, like, what did that just happen? Mm. And, and I'm looking around like, did anyone hear that? Did anyone <laughs> see that? And I know people did, but they're trying their best. Just, they think, okay, let's ignore it and we'll stop which I did the first time. I said, okay, I'm all right. And then it happened again. And uh, yeah, that's a whole other story. Because it's, um, I guess it's something that we can protect young players because I guess it's disheartening as, as for all races, as a white man, 
playing against uh, with a black man and then that black man faces racism abuse and you actually friends so that kind of brings the whole game down and and i believe sports has broken down a lot of barriers a lot of barriers in terms of racism politics whatever it may be it brings people together so it's just a shame to still see it operating like allowing that evilness to operate in football do you believe they could do more always always um i think the the recent incident with the rangers player uh glenn kamara it was abroad it was thinking uh slavia prague the team so that's a whole different like uh, ball game because in London, you don't experience it as much because of the integration. You, yeah. It's strange for someone to be racist when most likely one of their friends might be a black person or might be of different religion or different, you know, the discrimination just is strange in London because it's so multicultural. But where areas where there's a dense population of the same um, type of people, or should I say same race, I think that's where you would probably experience it the most. And um, I think they can do more. I think they can do more. I think if a player is racist on the pitch, for me personally, the game should be done. I agree with that. I I strongly agree with that. And uh, let's hope in time to come, sooner rather than later, this is really kicked out because it does ruin the game and it's a beautiful game that meant to unite people and bring everyone together. Um. Let's move on to social media. You just recently joined social media. Yeah, I'm new to the gram. Why? Man, I'm a private man. Man, yeah, private. I like. So why the change? You know, my agent said to me, "You want to build your name. You want to build your brand." Yeah. I thought, yeah, I do. <laughs> like, it'd be nice, you know, to have, like, the book, like, the messages that I want to put out there to the young players and stuff. And I, um, I. The reason why I play is to give back to the young players. And I don't mean, well, yeah, like literally. but Because you don't time. just play, you also coach. Yeah, I started coaching. I got my coaching badges at Sheffield United, which was good. They gave us like a backup plan if things didn't go well. Yeah. And um, uh, from there, I like, I coached. Uh, I like started to do one-to-ones with family. And then um, my barber's son coached him and he, he plays for Fulham. And then it branched out. And yeah, I coach anytime I'm off season or out of a club, I'll coach. And I love it. It's, it's the best feeling seeing something that you've, you've kind of given and they just show you it and they do it in their own way. Mm. And kids have a, an amazing way of expressing themselves. Um, I organized for West Ham's Youth Academy to come out to my team in Spain. Um, and they played against. Barcelona, Real Madrid, Atletico Madrid, and um, it was like a tournament, and <laughs> it changed my whole like reason why I played the game. Because before it was, I wanted wealth. I wanted to make sure my legacy and my family were good. Um, after I realized the harsh realities of the game, but now oh, seeing the kids just happy, you know, it, it it brings another fire inside me. It gives me that drive to to really never. Never stop trying to achieve the best, you know. That is beautiful. Literally, um, that is beautiful. So, you, so it's safe to say, once you, once you become of age, once you retire, you going towards the coaching route of things, or would you go to the commentary side of things? Oh man, I I think I won't marginalize myself at all, man. I I'll, I'll do it all. You see, I'm an, I'm an, a beginner author right now. The, um, the book is good. The uh, book is good, and I'm very much looking forward to the next one. It's eight steps to success to make <laughs> it as a professional footballer, and in brackets, ten percent Francis Co. I'm looking forward happen. to that. No, that's good. Um, thank you for joining us. It's been a pleasure, uh, but this is the part of the show that I really like. Yeah, I really enjoy. It. You close the show. Okay. So that's your camera. You say whatever you want to say to them. If we had a football, would have given you to do some kick ups, but we don't. You can sing, you can do some dance moves to them. Just say something that can take with them and you know, anything is totally up to you. Oh, all right. What can I say? So the power's in my hands. You've got the power. 
I'd J- say J- JB is looking at me like, don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> I'd say um, be yourself. I think that's a big one. Um, be yourself. If and also <laughs> express yourself and and do things that you love. Um, for me, it I feel like I feel like I'm living my 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 dream in a way every day doing something that I love and aiming to achieve something that I love and yeah I really would love everyone to just be themselves and cut out all the negative friends stay away from something that makes you feel bad when you do good you feel good when you do bad you feel bad so yeah that's that's all I can leave you guys with man wow and go go buy the book and if you don't buy the book DM me send you a free copy <laughs> oh I'm going to DM him right now. (laughs) Listen, if you do good, you feel good. Till next time, people. Love, peace, and happiness. I've been your guest. Mike has been the host. Thank you.